whose philosophy appears to give them more peace and contentment in society? Me, who's quite happily getting along with life, or you, who seem to be uh, quite uh, upset with anybody who disagrees with you? Let's go for this. Uh, are trans women women? No. Right. And what if they say they are? Well, people can say all sorts of things, but it doesn't make necessarily make it true. Uh, my view is that there are two sexes. Women belong to one sex. Trans women belong to the other sex. Uh, there's no overlap between the two sexes. You're either in one or the other, and therefore trans women are not women. Do you come at this from like a scientific... Because I don't know the science. I don't know much about anything, to be quite honest, and you are a scientist. So you coming at it from a scientific place. Is is there a clear science difference between men, men and women? Well, there is. It's in terms of our, it's in terms of our biology and how our bodies uh, developed long before we were born in order to uh, in order f eventually for us to reproduce uh, for the next generation. That's what the uh, difference is between men and women, and uh, between male and female, and between uh, women and trans women. I uh, you see, I start coming from a from a scientific point of view, but I come at it really from a logic point of view. I want to build my life on something that makes coherent sense, not something where uh, I can't justify what I say about uh, about things. Is it a case of like, you, you talk about we were, we were born differently or whatever, is it sort of XY and XX chromosome things? I don't even know what that entirely means. Chromosomes is most of it. Chromosomes is the blueprint so that uh, there's, there's basically two, two developmental paths. One is that you have a Y chromosome that includes uh, a gene called the SRY gene, which uh, triggers something that happens on another chromosome. I'm not a biologist, uh, but it triggers something on another chromosome. And that leads to the virilization, the fetus, about six to eight weeks it, you know, in, into uh, into pregnancy, uh, that's that's what happens in the vast majority of cases when uh, you produce a male. Now there are uh, there are intersex conditions. There are people whose uh, developmental path was different, uh, and they are sometimes used to obfuscate this truth, which is true for the vast, vast, vast majority of people. And as I say to people, I'm, I've got no intersex condition. And uh, unless uh, you've got an intersex condition, this, this argument is peripheral to what we're here to discuss, is that somebody who has XY chromosomes, whose body's developed along a normal male developmental path, you ain't a woman. It's an interesting one because I suppose there's a scientific one and I'm, I'm trying to play devil's advocate here because I've just had Katie Herzog on and people have gone mad at me and unsubscribed and stuff. Um, <laughs> so I suppose, is it a case of, um, are we being asked by some people in the trans, the trans ideology community to believe something that's not entirely scientific, scientifically accurate but as part of our culture in the way that, you know, we might say, uh, the sky is blue, or the sky is not really blue, but we we're, we'll just say it is because it sort of seems that way and it looks that way. Is 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 there a problem with just sort of going? Yeah, you're okay if you say you're a woman or a man, then you are. Well, if you go, actually, it's the saying if you are or not, which is causing the problem. If you go back fifty years, uh, that's when transsexualism was first. Uh, People, start, people started transitioning and could transition. The medical science was there so that uh, people could have hormone therapy and they could have gender reassignment surgery so that they passed pretty well in society. And th those sort of people, it was a bit... It was a bit unsatisfactory to say, yes, you, you've got XY chromosomes, you were born a man, therefore you're born, you're born male, therefore you're a man. It just didn't fit into the way that we, uh, we, saw, we saw those people. It was easier to accept them as female, accept them as women, and uh, life went on. But the, uh, the, what it means to be uh, transsexual, which was that, has been replaced by what it means to be transgender, which is just purely an assertion. I say I'm a woman, therefore I am a woman, uh, without the need for any evidence, any uh, backup, any any supporting, any, anything to support that. It's simply a statement of, uh, you know, an asserted statement of belief. And as such, it, it doesn't really have much meaning. If, if a woman is simply uh, a label given to people who say, I am a woman, it loses all sense of meaning. What is the difference between transgender and transsexual? Uh, well, according to Webster's Dictionary, nothing. <clears throat> I looked that up recently. Uh, transsexual has got exactly the same definition as transgender. But I 
think in most people's views, a transsexual is somebody who goes through what you might describe as a meaningful transition. So it may well involve hormone therapy, it may well involve gender surgery in order to uh, fit in, fit back into society, but in the other role, as it were. Whereas transgender is a, is a very broad term that encompasses transsexuals, certainly, but other groups as well, who perhaps 20 years ago uh, would have had other labels attached to them, perhaps transvestites, perhaps cross-dresser. Uh, do you think there are more people perhaps who are trans, uh, who, who also disagree with this sort of push towards trans ideology, towards the idea that trans women are 100% women who just are afraid to come out and say so? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Yes, there's uh, there there are people who in my like like me in my situation are quite willing. I've got the confidence in myself and the confidence in the in the situation I find myself in to be absolutely honest about what I what I think. But there are others who who can't who agree with me, but uh, couldn't possibly come out for, for one of, for for one of several reasons. I perhaps they're. Uh, frightened of uh, the repercussions because we've seen what the repercussions can be or they are so well uh, they're so well integrated into society how could they come out really to say that I'm I'm transsexual uh, when they've been passing unnoticed unclocked in society for years so they're in a they're in a vulnerable position and Part of the reason why they were not clocked was people never used to look too carefully. You know, people would see somebody and register, uh, oh, this, this person looks like a woman, therefore you put them in the woman box. Whereas now we're beginning to ask far more questions when you, uh, when you uh, see somebody in the street. We're, we're, this, is, this is more newsworthy. This is what people are thinking about. So those transsexuals who, some have been transitioned for 30, 40 years, are feeling anxious about this new movement, but, but because of their situation, can't, can't say much. Do you think that I probably come across a lot more trans people than I realise then, and they're passing and I just don't even think about it? I don't think there's many around. It used to be a, it used to be a tiny number of people whose whose psychological distress was so bad that they needed to transition. There are a few, uh, but I suspect, I suspect e, you don't notice them. And secondly, uh, there's, not, there's not that many. There are more people now who uh, possibly don't, you know, poss possibly, possibly pass well, possibly don't. But uh, going back more than 10 years, not very many. Well, I suppose the, the thing... The reason I sort of worried about talking to you and having you on the show, and you're 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 a fantastic speaker, and I love talking to you. So I I, I love the idea, that, you know, I love I've only just started talking to you, but I love the idea of talking to you. Um, is you often get with these things that are like big debates in society, and I think about sort of uh, I'm you know for, for myself, I always talk about myself, but you know being Jewish and the Corbyn thing, and then you'd get these uh, Jewish people who'd come out and say no, there was no anti-Semitism and that kind of thing, and you think like How? oh that's not fair, and he, they were being used as like ammunition, um, and I, I suppose historically that was that was known as an Uncle Tom, the the character from um, uh, Mark Twain, wasn't it? So are, are you accused of that kind of thing, and and do 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 trans people have a go at you and say you're you're setting them back and you know that kind of thing people say all sorts of things about me andrew they really do uh yes i've been called an uncle tom i've been called a quizling i've been called uh, i've been quizling it's uh it was after the uh the leader in norway uh when norway was uh when norway was occupied by the nazis during the second world war so it's a basic, basically, it's somebody who collaborates. I collaborate with the, uh, but I, I don't collaborate with anybody. I'm just, I'm just saying what I think. I know what it means for me to be, uh, me to be transsexual. I've made significant changes to my body. I've made significant changes to where I present myself so that I am more comfortable with my body. And I just go about my normal day's life in society without needing to make uh, assertions about being something a woman who I don't think I am. And I don't think any trans person needs to uh, make those assertions. And what's perhaps, you know, one thing I do say to people is that this is my philosophy, is that uh, I'm a gender non-conforming male who's made changes to my body, so I'm more comfortable with it. Your philosophy is that you're really a woman who was born in the wrong body. But uh, 
whose philosophy appears to give them more peace and contentment in society? Me, who's quite happily getting along with life, or you, who seem to be uh, quite uh, upset with anybody who disagrees with you? And so maybe you can you can help me understand what's going on, what what goes on in your head then to to be a gender non-conforming person. What does that feel like, actually feel like? Well, I don't know. All I know is how it feels to be me. This is this is the problem we can all, you know, I, I sometimes hear the term, I feel like a woman, there I'm a woman. You say, well, what do you mean by feel like a woman? How do you know? And we can only know what it, what it means to be, what it means to be ourselves. So uh, you talked about this. What does it feel to be a gender non-conforming male? Uh, well, I'm a male. I don't feel male. I am male. And I'm gender non-conforming because I uh, present myself differently to you, do, the way you present yourself, and the vast majority of males present themselves. So it's a description of uh, the way I interact with society. But what's actually going on? I think it, I think it is linked to uh, sexuality. There is a, a move in the transgender community to separate it from that. But if we weren't, if men and women weren't weren't sexed beings if we weren't in sex bodies what what would it mean to be trans it it wouldn't have any meaning at all so it is linked in with our sex and it is linked in with uh with our sexuality because that's how we relate to ourselves and we relate to other people and where i've come to i've come to terms with it it's in terms of uh how i uh you know, how we all how we all signal to other people into society, because we, we do it. You know, there's something in us which says, you know, I'm happy presenting myself like like this. And what we're effectively doing is signaling our sex. And that's and that's the uh, you know, that that's what human beings do, just like just like any other species of animal does it. You know, we need to signal our sex in order to uh, signal to the opposite sex. Otherwise, a, a species that didn't do that wouldn't last very long. You know, if the sexes weren't uh, uh, didn't notice each other and weren't attracted to each other. So I think it's all about sexual signaling. And what I would say is I prefer to signal in the same way as the opposite sex. You know, some some men are attracted. Most men. Uh, a signal as men and are attracted to women. A small number of men are, are attracted to their own sex and another group, well, not so men, but another group signal in the ways the opposite sex. So this is what this is what's going on. Uh, I'd like to see some more research into it, but uh, it's it's not easy to research in this area, as you're probably aware, because you're uh, you start poking at balloons which people don't want poked at in case they burst. Yeah, that's a really interesting theory, though, that it's related to attraction because I hadn't heard that before, and I wonder if maybe people are wondering that deep down, but it's not being said out loud that it's related to who you're attracted to and who you want to signal to and that kind of... I think the suggestion normally among most trans people is it's nothing to do with that, it's just they feel like a, a woman, which which is... I don't feel like a man, and I've never felt like a man. I just sort of... I think it's very similar to what you've said, which is just you're just you. I just sort of wake up and I'm me and I've got my arms and my sort of hairy whatever. But if it wasn't hairy, then I'd, I feel like I'd feel the same. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think, I think the difficulty comes from people who are trying to define this in terms of the... It's, the, it's a verb to be. You know, I, uh, I am a woman. I feel like a woman. And you think, well, what does this mean? Uh, whereas what, in my view, is the verb I prefer is to do. So uh, I, I, I do things in the, in the way that I present. So I can say, I do this, I do this, I do this, because it makes me feel more comfortable with my, myself and more comfortable with my relationship to the rest of society. And, that's, and that, I think, is more concrete. And we, you went back to what I was saying before about, is it a scientific reason for saying this? And I think it's just, it's just easier in terms of the logic there. I can understand that. And I think I can, other people can understand it as well. Have you found since the sort of since this move towards the, the trans ideology of the day uh, has intensified, have has the has the world been kinder to you, or as a trans person, or has it been more difficult? In terms of my everyday life, there's been no, there's been no difference. Uh, in the UK, we live in a we live in a tolerant, accepting society, and uh, I've not. You know, in, in real life, absolutely nothing. I do the same job as I did five years ago before this really kicked off and 10 years ago when I transitioned and 15 years ago and I'm accepted for who I am and, and, and the quality of the work I do. Uh, out in society, out, you know, if I go out into town, 
yeah, the, yeah, people probably clock me as trans. People couldn't care, really. You know, it's, it's just not a problem. The difficulty comes uh, often in the online environment, which is where people where people uh, notice that, and that's where uh, that's where it can get it can get really nasty and really difficult. And what I notice online is people who are concerned about their own rights and concerned about losing their own rights, and uh, and the debate can sometimes get very toxic, very polarized, and very divisive. And that's something that's not been very helpful for anybody, I don't think. You seem you're suggesting, I think, that being a trans person in the UK in the 2020s, the 2010s, and all that. Um, is is not a difficult is, is people are very accepting towards you yeah. i guess but yeah. is that maybe could that because i'm always hearing that the sort of trans people are being killed and uh, i'm reading that a lot and it's so bad and everyone hate everyone's being and and i wonder maybe it's a class thing as well you're obviously a very well educated person who's a teacher at school and everything so could there be some of, of that as well well you mentioned about trans people you know being be, being killed but we are we are quite a safe demographic the uh transgender de- de- remembrance figures are published every year and the UK I think there's been 10 trans people murdered in the last 10 11 12 years and one of them by another trans person and if you look down at the figures it's domestic situations people are murdered by people they know which is uh, typical of other murders and there's a crossover with prostitution as well so it's not necessarily that we're trans it's that uh, it's when people find themselves in difficult situations you mentioned you mentioned class yeah you know class class is the big divide divider in 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 our in in uh, in our country in the uk rather than race or other other issues it's class so whether you're trans or not is far, far less important than where you would fit into society as it as it was. I was and I can I can read it off. I, you know, when I transitioned, I was I was white, I was male, I spoke English, I was educated, I had a professional occupation. I had all those advantages which uh, which though which that group has. And then I transitioned, and if I'm being honest, I, I returned them. And uh, I've carried on with those. And if anything, because if people realise I'm trans, then uh, nobody wants to upset the trans person, do they not? So sometimes I feel people dancing on eggshells around me. I wish they wouldn't. But uh, I certainly, I certainly, I certainly don't feel uh, marginalised and discriminated against, and uh, all the all these terms which I mentioned about trans people. Now, now some trans people are in those situations, but I'd say it's probably not because they're trans. It's other things in their lives which are deplorable and wrong, and we need to uh, we need to address those. What, what what things would they be? Well, poor. I, I guess the one of the things I notice is poor mental health. When people are struggling with uh, with with transsexual, whatever you want to call it, gender dysphoria, psychological distress, it can do really dreadful things to your mental health. And people people who are in a poor state of mental health suffer in society. We don't uh, we don't I don't think treat people in poor mental health in the same respect as you would people in poor physical health. Uh, we we don't. You know, we 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 need to uh, look again. I think at the way we view mental health. But people people can be in a situation where their mental health is poor, and rather than look at the situation, and think, look, how can we improve this person's mental health? The the uh, situation is where it's because they're trans, and possibly it's not. Perhaps perhaps being trans has led to the uh, poor mental health, but. You know that's something that we, which we need to uh, we need to address, rather than saying, as I hear, is you know you know being trans is not a mental illness, which it isn't and it shouldn't be, but it can cause poor mental health, and that's something which we need to recognise. I suppose the <clears throat> the eternal debate is is it cause is it the person has uh, poor mental health or because of society and the way society society reacts to them that it causes poor mental health, and I suppose you would say you would be in the former. Camp. Yeah, well, you know, poor mental health can lead to a negative reaction, which can then lead to worse mental health and a worse reaction, and it can be a it can be a very much a, a downward spiral. Uh, which, again, I deplore those things. I think people in poor men- with, with poor mental health should be supported, uh, and we need to do everything we can with those 
with with people in that situation and one of the uh, one of my campaigns as a trans person is to uh, increase the money which goes into local mental health services because there isn't enough and not just for trans people but for everybody we seem to have a mental health crisis in the country and, and on that note i mean how are you debbie because I, I often see you obviously debating and sometimes fiercely so uh in, in the same mold as andrew doyle for example who's you know big debates and I sometimes what I want to say like okay but you know how are you feeling because you, you're getting a lot of shit from both sides um, and that must be difficult so yeah how are you? Uh, I'm I, I, I'm fine because of my real life situation I've got a strong family I've got uh, I've got a good job I've got things to keep me busy in real life and uh, I go out into the into the debate it's something I do it's an add-on rather than a core part of my identity but going out, going out into uh, going out into that debate is hard. I do get, you know, I do get observations of a negative sort from all different angles and all different perspectives. Uh, trans people will accuse me of being uh, of being uh, anti-trans, trying to undermine trans rights from the, you know, trans, undermine trans rights. People on the other side will see me as uh, as the worst kind of trans activist because I'm plausible. You know, so I've I've had that that uh, you know I've was it myself and uh, another campaigner who's got similar views to me were worse than a whole army because uh, we were plausible and I'm thinking well I'm not I'm not trying to be uh, you know I'm not I'm not trying to take sides here at all I'm just coming in with a with a worldview I'm saying this is what I think I think that you know human beings are human beings and. Uh, we have our differences, we have our peculiarities, and uh, the uh, the differences make us human. A small number of human beings are attracted to our own uh, attracted to their own sex, and that's fine. A small number of human beings signal in the way in the same way as the opposite sex tend to signal, and that's fine. And that's where I'm coming from. Uh, but one one group is not happy with that because I'm denying the fact that. I'm really the other sex. I'm not, and I think the other group is concerned about it. I, I can see, you know, I can see that I can see their concerns in that women are trying to uh, in trying to protect their spaces, their associations, their groups, and how can they protect them against a trans person of the other sex who passes? very well because you can't always tell you know how do they protect that and from a from a position of a woman a woman to explain this to me and said we're at your mercy still here because if you don't out yourself in this situation how do we know and again i can you know i can see i can see exactly those arguments and i'm quite happy to have the i'm quite happy to those debates you know the very fact that i could uh you know, I could pretend to be the opposite sex and go. It's 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 ludicrous because I'm so open and I'm so uh, you know I'm so public in who I am. I you know I can't possibly do that, but other trans people can and other trans people do. And you know, trans some you know transsexual, just trans women, transsexual males, whatever term you want to use, uh, do pass unnoticed in society. It does you know they 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 do manage that, especially if they're not you know. You know, especially if they're not too tall. Height, you know, height is the biggest thing. If you see somebody who is five foot seven and they've taken uh, they've taken the effort to go through a, a transition, then they will pass. It's harder for me at six foot. I'm six foot four, so I never stood a chance. Yeah. It's funny how much um, there's a lot of talk about changing rooms, isn't there? And I'm just thinking now, I don't remember the last time I was in a changing room. I guess some people have more active lives than me. They're always in changing rooms. I haven't since I was a kid i suppose would you get you would go into the male changing rooms uh in a in a in a communal changing room I, I i wouldn't fit in very well in the male changing room and i think i think it would uh it wouldn't bother me but it, it well it, it would it would be awkward i don't uh i don't look very male when i'm when i when i'm in the showers for example you know not anymore so my view my view on this is that you know there are communal changing rooms around, and they should they should be uh, they should they should be pr 
protected according to sex. You know, we, we, there's got to be a meaning according to that. But for goodness sake, let's have additional provision for people who don't want to share their communal facilities. And that will include trans people and it will include other people as well. You know, that uh, and especially from a male point of view, I think, you know, the two the two sexes are different. Uh, I've, I've got to uh, in my 50s now and just this is just by observations of men and observations of women and my experience of a man was great suspicion of uh, of communal changing rooms I know I, I would have done anything to avoid them they were pretty unpleasant now female you know female friends will describe their spaces differently uh, so you know I, I think there's a male female difference but I'm not saying that we should, you know, if people want communal facilities, which are single sex, then let them have them. I don't think we should be stopping people doing that, but we shouldn't be forcing people into those groups, into those facilities. Uh, and that includes trans people. So uh, I, I would use uh, addition. Yes, yeah, what I would say is additional provision for people who don't want to share with their own sex which I think is not just trans people. But that's not always practical, is it? If you've got a gym with hundreds of people and so you've got the male change rooms, the female change rooms, and then like a, a, a solitary space for every single individual who does. And I, and I feel, I, I'm, I can see just, you know, talking to you and looking at you and you're, you you seem so nice and lovely and 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 just, you know, not not something that w women should be scared of, um, but I, under I understand arguments on all sides. But also that I get your point that you would feel extremely uncomfortable, or not maybe not extremely, but a little uncomfortable in the male changing rooms as well. We it does feel like we're in a bit of a quandary. Yeah, and it and it's it's our it's bodies, and it's it's having cha changed my body. Uh, you know, so you know, toilets the one thing we never used to talk about toilets five years ago, but it's become it's become an issue. But toilets, you've got cubicles in the toilets. It, it doesn't. You know, I tend to I tend to seek out those uh, cafes. That, you, you you know like Starbucks with the single, you know, with single cubicles with the, the self-contained place. Those are places I tend to, uh, I tend to seek out, but, you know, mil, mil, you know, mill toilets, they do have cubicles. So it's not, it's not an issue. It's really not an issue, but open plan changing rooms are. Now, if you're talking about gyms, I'm not, I'm not somebody who goes to the gym, but I do go swimming, but all the swimming pools I use have enough single cubicles for people who want to use them. And I'm thinking the two, uh, the two swimming pools are used. One has got one of these changing villages, you know, where everybody's in single cubicles. Now, some people don't like those. My, my view is if you've got a changing village, perhaps we should mark one area off for women only, one area for men only. So if you want to be, you do that, and an area in the middle for, you know, use, whoever wants to use it would, would be my suggestion there. And the other, the other, the other, uh, the other one was uh, an old Victorian swimming pool, which just had a, a load of cubicles along the poolside. And at some point in the past, from the, uh, from the uh, deep end all the way down to the middle of the pool were female. And then suddenly they were then de designated male on the other side with nothing obvious in the middle. So the suggestion there was, well, you know, perhaps we should just mark the one right in the middle as male or female, because it doesn't matter, really. And, uh, and I think we can get bogged down on those sort of things. So, again, it's trying to come up with solutions which protect everybody's rights and protect the things that everybody needs. That's what we should be trying to do. And it's not difficult. You've said that self-identification puts women and children as well as trans people at risk. And why is that? Well, this is where... This is what I said about trans people passing in society. And... Uh, and trans people making make, making that transition. When somebody transitions, there is a there always used to be an understanding that there was some sort of gatekeeping involved, some sort of checks and balances. Somebody who had a look at this person and said, "Yes, this person is not is is not deluded. Is not uh, you know is of is a sound mind uh, to do this." There was always that assumption there, so it provided a little bit of a well, provided it provided some safeguarding the process. To remove that with self-identification allows people basically to choose their legal sex without anybody else having a say so. Not even a GP to sign a piece of paper to say, actually, yeah, this, this person is knows what they're doing and is of sound mind. Not even that. So suddenly what it means to be a man or a woman is simply a tick box exercise. Now, I said that's a danger for women because how do women protect their own 
species groups associations if they can't even rely on a birth certificate you know a, you know a birth certificate to say i you know I, I if a birth certificate says you're a you're a woman then you're a woman basically uh so that's that's the danger for for women they're they're unable to police those now you can say well people don't come up to you and say I've, can i see your birth certificate please but uh what women have told me is that uh should somebody be in their spaces, in their changing rooms, in the you know whatever whatever environment, uh, who they don't think should be there, then they've got to go to the thing of challenging them, saying what you know who are you and what are you doing here, and if that person can come back and say, I am a woman, how dare you make that accusation, even if they're six foot five with a full beard and uh, you know and broad shoulders, uh, you know even if they say that then. If there's any chance, possibly, that, that person might have a birth certificate that says they're a woman, then it puts women in a very, very vulnerable position, and they're less likely to challenge. So it it it, it removes the uh, ability of the women to challenge, and you know we we know that members of our sex will look for safeguarding weaknesses. They will look for situations when they can, uh, you know, avoid the normal checks and balances. And if they think this is something where they can say this and be, not be challenged, then it's going to attract the wrong sort of people. And I'm going to come back to that on the third one, because that, that's where women suffer. Where children suffer is, again, reducing sex to this tick box exercise. You can choose your, your sex, just tick a box on a form. What we're saying to children is you can choose your sex. You can grow up to be a, a man or a woman, whatever you, whatever you prefer. And you can't. You know, you, you can't do that. We're, uh, you know, we are our bodies. We're a product of our bodies as well as just inhabiting those spaces. And if you've got a female body, then you will grow up to be a woman. You might be able to uh, become a trans man, uh, but you're not a man. And the same way, if you've got a male body, you're going to grow up to be a man. And if you make attempts to change it, you won't become a woman. Uh, but the self-ID says to children that this is a possibility. So... Children are left in this quandary of then almost being told to, you know, the thing, you know, can you, you can choose your puberty. You know, there's, there's drugs which you can take, so you can choose to go through this puberty or that puberty. And children get, children suffer enough with the uh, choices of GCSE, you know, when, when children come to the end of year now, and I know this, and they've got to make some option choices. And they go through a quandary of saying, should I drop geography or should I drop a, you know, physics DT. And if, and if I drop the wrong subject, ah, you can't drop physics. Physics is compulsory <laughs> three to 16. Uh, but uh, if I drop the wrong subject, then my life might be ruined. And we're saying this, you, if you can you know, drop the wrong puberty. So I, I worry about children. And then back to trans people is that without any checks and balances, there is, you know, there is a there is a, a safeguarding weakness here, and we need to accept that. If I if I am taken for female and I pass as female, people are going to judge me differently, and uh, and they're going to assess me differently because we all assess men and women differently. Now, that you know that's a safe that is a safeguarding weakness. If people think that they can uh, they can take advantage of that simply by ticking a box, and people will. You know, there are the people who are on the lookout for safeguarding weaknesses are on the lookout for safeguarding weaknesses. So we're going to attract the wrong, you know, we're going to attract those people who are, you know, who, who are going to bring the whole thing into, into a state of disrepute. I've used an argument over, uh, I got into trouble for this actually, but simply for blue badges on, uh, on, on car parking. So for example, Anybody can choose to uh, anybody can choose to uh, self de self define as disabled. Whenever I fill out an equal opportunities monitoring form, you know, you turn onto the back of the form and it says tick your race, I tick white British, tick your sex, I sort of tick male, uh, you know, and sexual orientation, everything else, and it says, do you consider yourself to have a disability? And I say no. But if I tick yes, it's it, it is by self declaration, is that? But if we allow people to uh, have legal rights as well. So that, for example, you, you know, one of those blue badges you get for your car, so you can park on all the double yellow lines, not get parking a parking ticket. Now, I wouldn't do that, but some people would. 
you know, if you can just get this pass and you can convince yourself that you really are disabled because you've got, you know, you, you, whatever else, and you've got, you can just leave this on the dashboard and you'll park on double yellows and never get a parking ticket. Some people are going to do that. And the the uh, the uh, impact of that would be the whole system being brought into disrepute and probably people who generally did need those passes being abused, being subjected to abuse and uh, discrimination because, you know, because the whole system's been affected. And that's what I see with self with self declaration. Uh, I I I. No, I've, I've never actually done this myself. I've never, I've, I haven't changed my legal sex. My legal sex remains male. I just don't see a need to do it. But some people have done it, and uh, and for them it's been it's been important. But uh, bringing self identification and the whole system uh, suffers because uh, without without any safeguarding without any checks and balances the whole system being, is brought into disrepute you're talking i guess about sort of maybe men who are just like you say take advantage of it go into women's areas and do whatever they do is there is there also a sense of competition in in trans in within the trans community is there a sense of hey i've gone and you know almost i've got my badges i've gone and done the the surgery i've done this and i've lived as a woman for or or, or feeling like a woman for decades and you've just come along and you think you can just tick a box i haven't even bothered ticking that box because i've done all the proper things is there that a little sense of that well i think uh there is, it's the, the, there is, the, you know, that 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 hierarchy uh, that goes back years. But I, I, I actually I repudiate that actually, actually, Andrew. Uh, in my view, is if you declare you, you see, here I actually do believe in self ID. That if you declare you're trans, you're trans, and I'm quite happy for anybody to be self declare them declare themselves as trans. Uh, it's simply something which we can declare to do. So whether you've had surgery, whether you've had hormones, whatever you do, the only difference between, in my view, the only difference between a man. And a trans woman is that the trans woman says, I am trans, I'm a trans woman. It's just that simply that 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 declaration, that identification with a group. That is the only that is the only difference. And that is the reason why I can't accept this idea where that self-declaration then gets you legal rights. That's the danger. It's such a, it's really complicated because I'm thinking about like Katie Herzog was talking about people who detransition and you've said you're concerned about children. Uh, but if children really do feel like they want to go about life as a, as a woman, let's say it's a boy who decides he wants to be a woman and a girl and all those things, um, and and I understand all the problems with that. And even as I talk now, it's such a controversial topic. I can I can almost hear listeners, whichever way I say something, like, what are you talking about? I have a different opinion. Whereas, so I I'm just sort of making stuff up on the spot. I don't know what I'm talking about, and I'm, I happily admit that. But if you get it done young, you, it, it you can be you can pass much better, can't you? I mean, it's a huge difference in terms of the happiness you, you might have in your life if you do it young. At the same time, it's you know, it'd be much more likely that you're doing maybe the wrong thing because what do you know when you're 15 or 14? I, I don't know anything. Yeah, uh, there there is that. There is the thing. How do how do you know at that age? Before you know what it means to be an adult, how do you know? Uh, to uh, transition prepubescent children, I think is I think is I, you know, I I, th I think is abusive because the child cannot know what it means to be an adult uh, and cannot make those decisions. We don't let children tattoo their bodies because it leaves a permanent mark. We don't let children do other things. Uh, and, and if anything, the, uh, the age has been rising. So when I was 16, I could buy tobacco and I could buy fireworks. And people are happy to sell me those things. Not anymore. You've got to be 18. So we're, we're protecting children more and more apart from this. So children might make mistakes. And the other thing, you say, well, you know, if you transition young, uh, you may pass better. Well, should passing be all there is to it? And in what regards? Uh, if I, I, you know, I'll try and avoid getting too graphic about this, but gender reassignment surgery involves... Uh, be graphic, it, please. It, all right. Well, it, it, it involves basically uh, slicing open a penis, uh, taking the erectile tissue out, making a, making a hole, and then pushing that skin back inside. So that skin, that skin is what lines the neo-vagina. Now, if you transition a child, a boy, before he goes through puberty, there isn't enough. 
and that's uh, that's an issue. Now there are other ways of actually uh, of actually lining that you know that neo vagina. You can take uh, you can take bowel tissue. You can take uh, you can take tissue from elsewhere, but it doesn't work as well. The uh, gender reassignment surgery has been uh, was pioneered and has been tested on basically middle aged males with enough donor material as it as it, as it could be called to actually do the job. If if a boy has not gone through puberty because his puberty has been blocked and then he's been put on cross-sex hormones, he doesn't develop that tissue that he needs in order for that GRS to work, uh, work effectively. And the uh, classic example is the one of Jazz Jennings, who's the American uh, teenager who uh, who's who was transitioned as a pre -pu pre pubescent boy it was a big big tv program in america i am jazz so this uh, trans child uh was put on puberty blockers then cross sex hormones had uh, had gender surgery on the 18th birthday and it just didn't it, it didn't work very well and of course, it adds to it adds to the drama of the TV program. Oh no, there's been there's been complications, and it brings in the viewers. But there's a life here, and if you just allow this in this, you know, jazz to go through male puberty, and then get to the adult and say, this is what it means to be a man, jazz. Do you want to do this? Do you want to be a man? You know, sorry, well, no, we don't have any choice about being a man. Let's face it. But uh, do you want to transition now? Then it. Jazz could have made an adult decision about it, so it would have been Jazz's decision, and would have had the donor material needed to uh, do the, you know, do do what needed to be done. So it's not, you know, it's not as simple as saying if you uh, transition a boy before his voice breaks, then he won't have a, he won't have a problem with voice going through through life. Uh, it's more complicated than that. I'm so I've never been this wary of saying anything in case somebody gets you know just like I said the K Katie Herzog one I I lost like subscribers just dropping off and then I also think like well look if those people are that close minded they can't even be bothered to to watch it and actually listen and then you know good riddance in a sense this this debate is so is so divisive Andrew and I've tried to think about where have I come across this before and. You know, when 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 I was a teenager, I, I had a season ticket at Newcastle United. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> we 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 won the we won the second division at one point. We never won anything <laughs> of any of any sorts. But I had a season ticket at Newcastle United, and I watched I'd watch Newcastle, and in that sort of mentality, you were either with us or against us. You were either sat with us, or you were in that group at the other side. And this this is what happens here. And as a commentator, I. I I much prefer to say, well, I'm watching a football game, and I'm going to I'm going to commentate on what I uh, on what I see on the on the football on the football field. And if 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 the other side scores a brilliant goal, I will uh, applaud that. But I've got I've I've been in trouble in the uh, I got into trouble once, you know. And it was you know somebody basically launched launched the ball from just inside the halfway line, went straight over, and it, you know, and in front of the goal where I was sitting, and of course there's deathly silence around. Uh, and I sort of said, what a goal. And of course, everybody <laughs> looks at you and, and you think, oh, you're not supposed to say that, are you not? So, I, yeah. and I see it's that, it's that same sort of, uh, it's that same sort of very divisive behavior going on here. You know, there's a, you have to agree with us on this. And if, if you're seen to be looking at other perspectives, then, uh, yeah, then yeah, it's, uh, it's dangerous to, uh, it's dangerous to express those views. What was it like being a young potential trans person going to the testosterone fueled terraces of a Newcastle football match? Uh, yeah, uh, it's what I was used to. I, 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 do, I, did, I did enjoy football. These were the days when you could stand behind the goal, and I used to. Uh, and, when, and, 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 when, uh, and, when, and when the play went over there, the crowd went down and the crowd went up. And I, 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 quite, I quite enjoyed that. It was, it was being part of something and being part of that. So, yeah, no, I, I was quite happy with that. I don't think, uh, you know, I, you know it, you say about testosterone fueled that uh, people who I know have transitioned in, in, in later life weren't necessarily, we weren't necessarily fe uh, feminine boys at all. That's not what it, that's not what it was all about. Okay. It would be, yeah. Cause that's what, you know, most people, we don't know anything about trans lives and stuff, and that would be the assumption and, you know, an unfair one, apparently. When did you get your 
operation and everything and when do you start when how old were you when you started doing all the trans stuff uh well i knew i knew there was something going on in me from from very young because I, I i desperately wanted to be a girl when i when i was very young so there was something there but couldn't do much about it so you just basically shrug and you get on you, you get on with other aspects of life you find other things to uh, to do there's no point wishing over uh, things that are impossible but it got to me in around 2009, 2010, and it was, it, it ties in with social media. And it's when you start meeting people uh, online, you know, until then, you, you, you meet people who you live with, you uh, live next door to, you work with, and you didn't meet any other trans people or not anybody who would come out as this. But once social media groups start, then you can then uh, you you can then find other people who think like this and 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 suddenly it became obvious to me that there were other people around like me you know very similar to me and and that transsexuals weren't this uh, exotic group of beings who uh, weren't weren't school teachers weren't secondary school physics teachers uh, was that very freeing for you well it, it, no actually it wasn't because you realize that i can do this you know, until then, I thought that to be a transsexual, you had to be uh, the sort of person who would go off to Morocco for private surgery, whereas I didn't do that. You know, that was that was not me. So suddenly you find that you can do this. And people are saying, well, look, I've transitioned. I've done this, this, this. All you've got to do is go and see your GP and get a referral to the gender clinic. So I think it's like, yeah. yeah. So once I realized that people could do it and I could do it as well, then it ceased to become some uh, some unachievable dream and something which I needed to do. And there was a sense of this was something that I had to do. And it became a compulsion that th this this was something which I would need to do. And this only this would make me satisfied in who I, in who I was. So that was 2009, 2010. I transitioned in 2012. So it was two years from that to transition. Was it painful? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's one thing that's got to be said is like when, when someone gets that operation i i feel respect because i just think bloody hell. we've got a friend of the family who had an operation recently and i think it was a chin something on the chin as part of it you know because the chin i think is often is often done and i i think it went a bit wrong and stuff and the agony the pain that they go through and i think that's the point when people uh, on the sidelines are going like, oh, yeah, well, whatever, they're a bunch of this and whatever. I think that's when you've got to stand up and take notice and go, you know what, that's far braver. Because I'll tell, i tell you now, well, actually, I don't, I don't know how compulsive that feeling can be, of course, of wanting to be a woman or a man or whatever it is. But I know that I've got, I can't breathe well through my nose. I'm supposed to have an operation on it. It's been about five, six years that I've been delaying it. And it's not even nothing compared to what you went through with that. So I, I applaud that bravery. What was that like? Well, the operation came four years later in the beginning. It was the beginning of 2016. So you had to do this, you know, this, the NHS do make you wait because they want to see it, it is irreversible, really. You know, you can't, they can't go rummaging around in the in the clinical waste bin and to stick things back on it. It doesn't, it doesn't work. So... So yes, so I, I knew I knew what I wanted. I, this was this was this was the compulsion. I transitioned. I went through a social transition at the end of 2012. I had hormone therapy in 2013, and at the beginning of 2016, I had gender surgery. I was an NHS patient all the way through. So you've got to, uh, you know, you, you, they 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 put you through the ringer. They really do. Uh, on the morning of the surgery, there's none of this being wheeled across the hospital to the operating theater. You put your dressing gown on and you walk with a nurse over there, up through the lifts, up through the public areas and uh, into the anesthetic room. And, uh, and he says, sit down here. So you sit down there. He says, you sure about this? I said, oh, sure. <laughs> he said, he said, Nervous. Yeah, he said, this is a very, very powerful uh this is a very powerful painkiller I'm going to put in here. This is it, you know. I said, just do it. They put you to sleep. Uh, yeah, it, it was. It was a general anesthetic, but they started. They started me on the diamorphine to start with it. So, uh, you know, so that was it. You know, the the, the stuff went in, and I uh, was floating around the room. And uh, did you look down and say goodbye? Not really. No, you weren't bothered. Uh, I wasn't bothered. No, it was something. It was. It was. It was something I needed to do. And. Uh, and then there's five days of bed rest afterwards because 
things are knitted together it is quite uh, you know things are moved around and stitched in and you want you want blood vessels to reconnect and you want things to reconnect so five days of of uh, of bed rest and then uh, and then you've been on a catheter of course so they take you off the bag and say you wander around now so they give you a uh, the, the, the they 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 put it on a on a, on a bag thing or touch your leg and I just remember I was I, I was in I was in the ward with another trans person who had the same surgery as me and we're there standing at the toilet with this leg bag on the catheter and you take the tap off and you make your little parabola over and I remember saying that we thought this we'd already done this the last time but no no but <laughs> it, we, it's it, you it, it, it's it's you know that's the way it went so I was in the hospital for a week and then I was discharged. Uh, I had complications afterwards. Uh, a catheter was removed. If this is too graphic, let me know. Uh, a catheter, the catheter was removed and uh, I just managed to, uh, urination was difficult, but I did it twice. And that was it, right? You've done it twice, off you go. And then it all swelled up, swell, swelled up. And it all swelled up. And things were getting, and I, I wasn't sure what was going on because I, I knew you had to, uh, you know, I knew, I, I knew you, you needed to go. So I kept drinking more and more water. I just didn't think there was anything in my bladder. So I was drinking more and more water and my bladder was getting fuller and fuller and fuller. And I just couldn't do anything. Everything had swollen up. So at 10.30 at night, I presented myself. I'd been, I was discharged from one hospital at two o'clock in the afternoon. And then I presented myself to my local A&E at 10.30 at night. I said, I've just had gender reassignment surgery last night, and uh, and I was in agony. And and what I didn't know that what what you know I, I was worried my bladder would burst, uh, but apparently it doesn't. Apparently it gets full, and then it just it just backs up into your uh, kidneys. I was told later that it can cause kidney damage, but we can give you some drugs to sort that. Don't worry, you know you you. There's a Simpsons episode where that happens, and it stayed in my mind since I was a kid. Uh, Abe, Grandpa Simpson's bladder bursts because they don't they don't stop to let him go to the toilet. Yeah, it just doesn't happen. It just backs up into your kidneys. So uh, I know this now, but at the time I was terrified. And uh, and it wasn't a particular, you know, I wasn't considered to be high 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 priority. It just it's just uh, just blockage. This is all. So you, you you take your turn, and about three o'clock in the morning, they brought a urologist out. Yeah, I said can't I said can't a nurse put a, a catheter back in? And they said not not a week after not a week after GRS we can't. Uh, we'll need to bring a urolo- We'll need to bring a urologist out. We've we've you know so. Out came the uh, registrar at about three in the morning. He said, uh, good morning, he said. He said, I'm the all-night plumber. I said, I realise <laughs> you've, got, you've got a blockage. <laughs> so he, he, uh, he, he, he put this catheter in and then he said, whoa, we haven't got a bag to attach this to. So the whole thing was flying around. So it's like a horse <laughs> pipe flying around the room. So <laughs> that was there. And then he did get into a bag and, apparently, and he got 1.3 litres out. And he said, he said, that's impressive to get 1.3 litres out of there, because most people's blood is filled up at about 700, 800 mil, apparently. Uh, but I said, oh, I've had experience of standing on the terraces at Newcastle when, you, you know, and, you, and that was, uh, but, you know, that was that. So that that came. That, so that was the complications I had. And I, you know, I laugh about it now, but it's quite terrifying is that when you realise that, uh, you know, that these complications happen and, this is this is elective surgery. I chose to do that a week early. I'd never had any problems in my life, and this was this elective surgery which I had chosen, which I was warned about in advance could lead to a permanent incontinence. I signed that away. It could lead to total loss of sexual function. Actually, that's that's more common uh, when when they sh- pull things around and shuffle it all around and stuff it all back. Uh, the uh, you know the the carpentry as it as it, as it as it is usually works uh but not always you've got the plumbing to worry about you can leave people permanently incontinent as a result and then you've got the electric sometimes the electrics don't reconnect and uh so you you, you sign all these waivers signing it to say this might happen this might happen this might happen oh and you might you might end up with a fit if if i uh, make the cavity in the wrong place uh you let you could end up with a fistula and that could be uh you know this that and the other and uh, and you do sign those things away and and to get in that situation you know, like grandpa simpson uh you know it it, it is yeah it, it is it is terrifying and 
and we and we and we you know and this is what kids are are being put on a on a on a path to and that's what i find terrifying it's scary when you think of it that way it really is quite scary so before my next question, uh, where can people find you, follow you, and that kind of thing? Right, I'm on Twitter at Debbie Hitton, just my name, and my website is debbiehitton.com, where all the pieces of work, which you know, lots lots of my work is archived there. So if you want to find out what I've been writing about, debbiehitton.com, or just follow me on Twitter. That's great. I follow you on Twitter, and there's lots of great articles and information and debates and things. Um, I was going to ask now. So this is just just. Um, I guess the stuff that a lot of us are a bit curious about. So we've just talked about the operation and stuff and like can and 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 tell me if if it's none of my business, but can can you have penetrative sex with a man? Can one do that? Does it work? Do the bits work? Yes, it works. Uh, well, yeah, so I'm told anyway. <laughs> uh I'm married I'm married to a woman. I stayed married to a woman, so uh uh, for me, it was it was uh, it was uh, it, it was uh, it was it was something which was a personal, you know, personal decision for me this, to make myself more comfortable with my body. But trans friends of mine say it does work. Because I'd love to be um, a woman if I could sort of push a button and not because what you've described is the most horrific surgery I've ever heard of. But if I could just push a button and be a woman for the day, and I've always said this, um, I would love it. It would be amazing. Just, you know, fiddle about, have some fun, see how people look at me differently. I would love that. And then, and I, and I don't mean to, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not trying to downplay, you know, the, the, the significance and importance of being trans and that kind of thing. But I just feel like there's so much to experience in life. And it's such a shame that we can't experience more of what it's like in another person's life and in, in another gender and that kind of thing. But and maybe they'll have sort of virtual reality that will allow for it one day, do you think? Well, it's how, it's how, important our bodies are to us because virtual reality you can uh, you can inhabit that avatar elsewhere but it's it's our physical bodies and we can only ever inhabit our own uh but yeah i think it's it is interesting thinking about what what life is like from somebody else's perspective but what i've learned is that my perspective hasn't hasn't changed that much and uh, my wife points that out you know she'll say that uh, you know that uh, you know that you 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 know you've changed a lot less than uh, you would imagine. What does she think of you, like embarking on this media career? Because she she must be thinking, oh god, we're getting all this flack now. Uh, we do, we do. Uh, I think she she has a she she she's got a concern about uh, the self identification and, and specifically the impact on children. Uh, so she's supportive of the campaigning I do, but she's got a life to live and uh, she's not that interested in, uh, in being, uh, you know, in, in, you know, in campaigning, in campaigning publicly. And uh, she's concerned, you know, the big, her biggest concern was with the children and you know, what would be the impact on, what would be the impact on them? But they're now 24, 21 and 19 so that they're, they're adults themselves and uh and they they've, they're away from home so they're, they're they're detached from it to some extent hi i'm andrew gold former bbc journalist i got a little tired of restrictions over who i could interview and what i could say and do so i made this channel click this playlist here and i'll be seeing you on the edge